Solids of Revolution are pretty cool because we get to turn 2D things into three-dimensional abstract, like conical shapes. And then we have to find the volume of those, in most cases. And so really, the, let's think about volume for a second. Volume is just the area. If we can find the area of some side of an object, then we multiply that by the thickness, and that gets our area. It's pretty simple overall. Now what a solid of revolution is, is basically we take a, we have a curve, and we're trying to rotate it around the x-axis, and that area that it, that's inside of it, because we can find the area underneath a curve, but if we rotate that curve 365 degrees, or 360 degrees, then the area inside, like between all curves, would be our volume. And so we have to think kind of three-dimensionally for this. But basically, if we have our axis like this, then we can plot some points on here. And we can say, okay, we're going to plot these points here, and since it's a solid of revolution, we're going to have to rotate this around. This is going to be our radius. And so then we get, like for instance this, this is a partial rotation, and as you can see, that this rotation creates our solid. So the volume is, normally, I mean, we would be finding the area underneath a, a curve, but here we're trying to find the area between all points with respect to that one axis. And so if we continue this all around, we'll get essentially a circle. Now, at any specific x-axis point, we get our area. And remember, it was area times thickness equals our volume. So the trick is we just take pi times our radius squared. So let's think for a second, what is our radius? Well, if back on our x and y curve, if we have a function that just goes up, then whatever that y value is, is going to be our radius. So we do pi times the radius squared, and then we have our area, but then what would be our thickness? Our thickness is just how long that this function continues for. For instance, again, if we have our x and y axis, then if it continues this far, that would be our thickness. If it continues only to, say, here, this is our thickness then. And so if we know the area at all points, and we know the thickness, then calculating the volume becomes almost trivial. Now, our functions don't always have the same area, right? I mean, if we go back and we make another graph, then then what happens is we don't get the same area unless it's something like y equals 6. But that's not a very exciting function. It's just y equals 6. And as you can see here, I mean, the function changes with respect to x. If we increase x, we can have all sorts of you know, parabolic curves or any, any type of curve. And so that's why we need to find the area using integrals. And so the radius is just the, the y value again. And then the interval will be our thickness. So we know that f of x is our radius, and the interval a to b is our thickness. So we can sort of make this into an, a more technical notation. It'd be pi times f of x squared would be our area of the circle. And then delta x is just our change in x. So if we went from a to b, then that would be our change in x. So we can write this as pi times f of x squared times delta x. And this equals our volume. Now, I don't know about you, but this looks suspiciously familiar to integrals. And so we'll see in the next slide that it really is integral notation. We can factor out the constant pi, and then it's from, as we go from a to b, f of x squared times delta x. So let's do a quick example. If our function was y equals x squared, and we had to find the volume of the solid of rotation of y equals x squared. So find the volume. Then what we would do is we say, OK, so we have, let's put this in integral notation. We have pi. We're going from a to b. And let's assume our interval, see, over the interval. Let's say we're going from 0 to 3. Then we go pi from 0 to 3, f of x squared, 
So we go x squared squared times delta x. And this would equal pi, we go from 0 to 3. So x, x squared squared equals x to the fourth times dx. Well, we can take the antiderivative. Take the antiderivative. Derivative. And that will give us, see, that will be x to the 5 over 5. And our interval is 0 to 3. So we could finally write this as pi times 0 to, going from 0 to 3. And we go x to the 5 over 5. And then we would plug in, plug in 3. So it would be pi. Well, we wouldn't need the interval notation anymore. It should be pi times x to the fifth over 5. And if we plug in 3, that equals our volume. And solving this in a calculator would be let's see, 3 to the power of 5 divided by 5. And our volume would be 48.6. And this is in whatever cubic units. So if this was in meters, we would say 48.6 meters cubed. Now the other type of question we can get is, we are given two functions. We're given, say, f of x and g of x, and they ask us, find the volume between those two curves. And really, this is quite simple. Intuitively, we know that the blue would be the volume of the, let's say, f of x. And then green here would be the volume of g of x. Now green is going to continue through. We just can't see it because it's being blocked by f of x. And so the volume between f of x and g of x is simply we calculate the volume of g of x. And then we calculate the volume of f of x. And then we just subtract them. And we take the absolute value of that. So we could say, let's say g of x equals g of x equals 10 and f of x equals 30. And these are in cubic units. Then we would go, say, 10 minus 30, which equals negative 20. And we take the absolute value of that, and we would get 20. So our volume between f of x and g of x, in this case, would be 20. So let's just recap over and find a procedure for doing this. The first thing you should do when you find one of these questions is write down the function. And we know that that would be your radius. And then we have to square the function because just like in pi r squared, we need the radius squared. So we square that function. That will give us our radius squared. And then we put it in integral notation and we factor the pi out. So then we have pi from a to b, f of x squared, times our interval, right? And this is essentially our area multiplied by thickness, just like that box in the first slide. Then we take an antiderivative of f of x squared. And here's, the, here's a big point where a lot of people make problems on. You must square it first. Must square first. That's some pretty messy writing. So what this means is you can't take the antiderivative of the function and then square it. You have to take the function, square it, and then take the antiderivative of the squared function. And then we'd be left with, say, let's say we started with f of x squared, or f of x equals x squared. Then we would need to take x squared squared, which gives us x to the fourth, and then we take the antiderivative. We can't, we can't take f of x equals x squared and then take the antiderivative of that and then square it. Okay, so then we just need to plug in the length of the interval into x. So if we went from 1 to 4, then the length of the interval is 4 minus 1, which equals 3. So then here we would just take x to the fifth over 5 and we would plug in 3 and then we have to make sure we don't forget about the pi because it would be pi times 3 to the power of 5 over 5. And so if we wanted to calculate that volume, 
then we've already done that, and that equals 48.6. Oh, wait, I didn't actually multiply by pi last time. Yes, here, here we have to multiply it by pi, because this is not 48.6 units. It's 48.6 pi cubic units. See, I forgot to multiply by pi. Don't forget about the pi. Don't forget. So now, this is 48.6 pi cubic units. Cubics. Don't forget about the pi. 